Welcome to the continuation of the Immune Deficiency Foundation's course on primary immunodeficiencies and immunoglobulin therapy. This final section will cover subcutaneous immunoglobulin therapy. I'm Beth Younger. I'm a nurse practitioner at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Currently, we manage over 250 patients who require immunoglobulin therapy. Ms. Ebland has already discussed the history of gamma globulin therapy. Specifically, subcutaneous therapy started in the 1950s. It was actually the first method of distribution of immunoglobulin. In the 60s and 70s, the administration was mostly intramuscular. That posed many problems for our patients, as Ms. Eplin has already discussed. The therapy involved into intravenous gamma globulin, but many patients, despite all attempts to find a good recipe for them had problems with IV gamma globulin. There were patients who continued to tolerate it poorly, so some physicians started to give small doses of gamma globulin subcutaneously. This was an off-label usage, but many patients tolerated subcutaneous therapy much better than IV therapy. So in early 2000s, the first product was introduced on the market specifically manufactured for subcutaneous therapy. Since that time, subcutaneous gamma globulin has literally skyrocketed. Patients are opting more and more to give their, themselves their immunotherapy via this method. This slide just talks about the landmarks in the history of replacement therapy, reiterating what I've said in terms of the evolution of therapy. So subcutaneous immunoglobulin is very similar to IV gamma globulin. It's manufactured the same way with the same safety steps to make it a safe, efficacious product. It works very similarly to IV gamma globulin, providing IgG antibodies to a wide range of pathogens, bacterial, fungal, and viral. It works to neutralize those antigens. It also increases opsonization and increases serum levels of IgG, and that's an important thing to remember. Gamma globulin products are almost entirely IgG. They're not manufactured to replace IgM or IgA. So the patient with selective IgA deficiency is not a candidate for immunoglobulin replacement therapy. Subcutaneous gamma globulin is currently approved by the FDA only for replacement therapy, that is, for the treatment of primary immunodeficiency diseases. It's really not known whether the smaller, more frequent doses of gamma globulin used for subcutaneous therapy are effective for treatment of autoimmune diseases. It's really not known whether there's an immunomodulatory effect. Now, I know that some physicians are using subcutaneous gamma globulin for these purposes, but at this point in time, that's an off-label indication not approved by the FDA. However, the good news is that research is ongoing. There are several products on the market which are approved for subcutaneous usage. These products differ in several ways, including the product concentration, the stabilizing agents used, and the amount of IgA contained in each of the products. So the things you need to think about trying to decide whether IV or subcutaneous use is appropriate are the efficacy of the products. It's important to know that both products are equally efficacious. They will both provide the immunoglobulin replacement that antibody deficient patients require. The important considerations are for the patients. Do they have a preference whether they would prefer their therapy IV or sub-Q? There's a quality of life issue. There's also a reimbursement issue. Not everyone's insurance policy is the same and gamma globulin isn't covered the same way under everyone's policy. There's also considerations for the prescriber. The prescriber needs to think about each patient individually. For subcutaneous therapy, there's a commitment factor. The patient is not going to be supervised. There's not going to be a nurse starting an IV providing the drug. The patients are going to do this themselves. They have to be committed to therapy and they have to be compliant with the therapy. It's no use prescribing therapy if the patient's not going to do it. There's also considerations 
if a patient has a physical limitation that may have an impact on their ability to self-administer. The prescriber may wish to see the patient frequently and really rely on the monthly visits to the infusion suite. Some patients have IV access issues. Some patients, as Ms. Eflin described, have significant adverse effects. And there also can be risks in patients with comorbidities. All those things have to be considered by the prescriber in making a decision whether intravenous or subcutaneous therapy is the best way to go. As I discussed, most products, whether they're IV or subcutaneous, are going to provide the gamma globulin replacement that patients need. They're equally efficacious. This slide shows essentially comparable efficacy between subcutaneous and intravenous gamma globulin. However, the key piece, and this is probably the most important slide in the entire presentation, talks about the levels of gamma globulin. When you give an IV dose, you're giving a big dose of gamma globulin. It's going directly into the circulatory system, and it's being absorbed quickly. You have a high peak the day you give the gamma globulin, and then the half-life of gamma globulin is approximately 21 days. So in the course of three weeks, the level drops off significantly, as you can see by the green line in this slide, and you reach a trough level. Some patients are very sensitive to that trough level, and they'll find if they keep a diary of their illnesses and symptoms that at that three weeks out from an intravenous dose, they're getting stuffy noses, they're getting fevers, they're starting to feel run down, and just knowing that it's time to get another dose of IV. However, with subcutaneous gamma globulin, you'll see by the pink line that once you reach steady state, the level of IgG barely budges. Patients tend to benefit from this very, very consistent level of gamma globulin and not have the problems with breakthrough infections, fatigue, and other symptoms that you get in the trough with IV gamma globulin. This may be a very, very important consideration for people with frequent breakthrough infections. The considerations for patient preference and quality of life are equally important. There have been multiple studies, this slide talks about one, where patients on replacement therapy were studied and patients on subcutaneous therapy believed that they had an improved quality of life. If you think about it, patients with primary immunodeficiencies have a chronic illness. Think about the body of illness, of the psychological effects of chronic illness. People feel powerless. They're dependent on other people. They feel out of control. Giving people the chance to give their own therapy, to be in control of their therapy, can have extraordinarily positive effects. I personally believe that empowering patients with chronic illness is a huge step in the right direction. And I think it's an important role that nurses have to take in their patients with these kinds of chronic illnesses. <clears throat> Reimbursement is another issue. As I said, all insurance policies aren't equivalent. The rates of reimbursement differ. Because subcutaneous gamma globulin is a newer therapy, some insurances reimburse it a little bit differently. Gamma globulin therapy, however you give it, is an expensive proposition. You're probably talking about a yearly cost of between $75,000 and $100,000. Most of us can't afford that just for our medication, so we really need to look at our insurance policies and figure out what they're going to cover. Sometimes subcutaneous gamma globulin on the surface can seem more expensive, but when you factor in nursing costs, infusion suite costs, home care visits, the cost becomes more expensive IV than sub-Q. So it's important to consider the insurance benefits for each patient, and the patient needs to be a part of that decision. The prescriber considerations are also many. As I said, one has to consider if the patient's going to be compliant with therapy. If a patient comes in and tells you they forget to take their blood pressure medication every day, one has to wonder whether they're going to remember to do their subcutaneous therapy weekly, something that's a little bit more involved than taking a blood pressure pill when you brush your teeth in the morning. Some patients need to be seen frequently in clinic. Patients with 
other comorbidities who need more frequent monitoring benefit from monthly visit to the infusion suite. Prescriber may need to see them more frequently and want them to come in for an IV dose monthly. Giving subcutaneous gamma globulin does take a little bit of some manipulation and some kind of some dexterity. Patients with comorbidities of, for example, arthritis may have some problems handling self-infusions. It may be a consideration when one's making a decision between IV and subcutaneous use. Physiologically, the prescriber may choose to prescribe one versus another. For example, in a patient with bronchiectasis or chronic lung disease, it may be beneficial to keep IgG levels more consistent and avoid those peaks and troughs to better control the chronic lung disease. The last thing for the prescriber is that he or she needs to be committed to assisting the patient with therapy. This isn't a therapy that you teach patients and send them off without follow-up. There's some troubleshooting that needs to be done. There's some follow-up of people having problems with therapy that need to be done, and the prescriber needs to be intimately involved in this follow-up. So he or she needs to be committed as well as the patient. Adverse effects are an important consideration when choosing a product. Ms. Epland ably described problems with IV gamma globulin whether it's headaches, whether it's nausea, whether it's fatigue, body aches, a feeling of just feeling you've been run over by a truck for several days after infusion. Despite pre-medication, despite post-medication, there are some patients that it's just very, very difficult to find the right recipe for. Subcutaneous gamma globulin is given in small doses. It's absorbed slowly. Patients who've had adverse effects with intravenous gamma globulin frequently don't have it with subcutaneous gamma globulin. Frequently the smaller, more frequent doses that are absorbed slowly avoid adverse events. In my own practice, we've had patients that we've had to heavily medicate or pre-medicate for gamma globulin given IV with acetaminophen, with steroids, with anti-migraine medications, We've changed those patients to subcutaneous therapy and find that we don't need to medicate them at all anymore. However, saying that, that doesn't mean there's no adverse reactions with subcutaneous infusions. The good thing is that most of the reactions with subcutaneous therapy are localized reaction. There's swelling, there's some inflammation at the injection sites, there's some itching. Big time systemic events are relatively rare. So what is subcutaneous gamma globulin? Basically, it's the gamma globulin product put into subcutaneous tissue using an infusion pump or a syringe driving pump. The weekly dose generally is a quarter of the monthly IV dose. Typically, and almost always, it's self-administered or it's administered by a family member, a caregiver, but not a nurse. But the nursing role is very important. Both the prescriber and the nurse have to think about the things that we talked about previously. Choosing the right patient, making sure the patients understand what their disease is all about and how important gamma globulin replacement therapy is. When one has made a diagnosis of a primary immunodeficiency, patients need to understand that diagnosis and understand that while the disease can't be cured, it can certainly be managed and that they have an important role in the disease management. Remembering that, the regimen design is critical. It's not good enough for the prescriber to say that a patient needs four grams of subcutaneous gamma globulin weekly. It's important that, that the prescriber considers how those four grams are given and that they design that regimen with the patient. The patient has to be a full partner in deciding how the infusion is going to go. We talked about skills necessary for self-administration. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. And then the need for monitoring and therapy management is also important. So who are the best candidates for subcutaneous gamma globulin?
basically it can be most any patient with an antibody deficiency in hypogammaglobulinemia. But good candidates are patients who've had a history of adverse effects with intravenous therapy. Patients who have IV access problems, who need three and four sticks every month to access a line for their therapy. Patients who have a strong desire for independence from IV infusions, whether they're hospital or home-based. Even getting a good IV recipe, patients are still committed probably to a three or four hour period once a month. Now that may be fine for some patients, but for working people, that's using up paid time off. For students, that's taking time away from school. Taking time away from school in the first grade is probably fine, but for a high school student, missing a half a day of school a month could be extraordinarily problematic. One needs also to consider comorbidities. For example, in patients with inflammatory bowel disease or a protein-losing enteropathy, a small frequent dose of gamma globulin is going to provide better prophylaxis than a large dose that's going to be quickly excreted. And lastly, again, my most important point that I keep hammering on is the patient's desire to control and manage their disease. It's critical that one remembers that the patient is the person with the disease and that all therapy needs to be designed with them. So the dosing recommendations for subcutaneous therapy are usually between 100 and 200 milligrams per kilogram per week. The dosage isn't one size fits all. Clearly it needs to be individualized based on the levels that you wish to achieve and more importantly than numbers is the clinical response. If you have a patient on subcutaneous therapy, they're continuing to have sinusitis, bronchitis, other infections. Clearly, even if the IgG level looks like it's protective, you may need to think about increasing the dose. The clinical response is just as important as the lab values. The nice thing is that levels can be sampled at any point in time. There's really no peak and trough, so an IgG level can be drawn before a dose, after a dose, three days before a dose, three days after a dose. It really doesn't make any difference. The last thing to remember is that this is still expensive therapy and the dose should be designed to avoid wasting any drug. Now the vial sizes come in rounded grams, so one shouldn't be giving 1.5 grams. One should be giving either one gram or two grams. If the dose really is that you'd like to give is 1.5 grams, one can choose to alternate weekly doses with one gram and then two grams so that you're getting the total three gram every two weeks that you desire. The nursing role for subcutaneous gamma globulin training is absolutely critical. The success on the, of this therapy depends entirely on how good the initial teaching is, not only about how to do the therapy, but what the expectations post-teaching are. So the nurse absolutely has to educate. She, needs to edu she or he needs to educate about the disease and the importance of therapy. Patients need to understand that this is a lifelong diagnosis in most cases and that therapy will need to be lifelong. It isn't something like well, as soon as I get my IgG level back up to normal, I can stop therapy. And if it falls, then I can start therapy again, and I can go off and on therapy. It's important therapy that needs to be continued. The nurse's role is also in instruction, not only in how to give infusions and how to do infusions, but how to troubleshoot, how to make adjustments that the patient can make himself or adjustments that need to be made in collusion with the prescriber. The nurse's role is also critical in advocacy. These are patients, again, with chronic illnesses. The nurse's role has to be to advocate for their patients, to empower them to take control of their disease and their therapy. That's when success is going to be achieved. So the nurse needs to remember some key points as she or he is teaching. Again, the explanation of therapy is critical. That baseline foundation is important. The benefits of therapy are important that the patient understand. As we said, the steady state IgG levels. Patients need to understand that they need to give the therapy consistently 
They can't give it on Monday this week, Thursday next week, Saturday the week after, and then, oh my, did we miss a week somewhere in there? They need to establish a consistent regimen. Patients need to understand what the expectations for therapy are. That's everything from how long an infusion is going to take, for what kinds of effects they should have from their therapy, what kinds of equipment they need. They also need to understand that there's going to be a period of adjustment. I always teach my patients that the first time they get subcutaneous gamma globulin is always the worst, and it absolutely gets better with subsequent infusions, but they can't have an unrealistic expectation for the first time they get this therapy. Patients have to have clear written instructions. To go back to Ms. Eplin's scenario, there's a recipe that works, and it's important to have the recipe written down. Patients absolutely need resources for problems and follow-up. They need to know who to call, for what they need to call, and to discuss problems, not just think that problems are what's expected. So effective patient training involves the use of appropriate learning tools. This also needs to be individualized. Not everyone learns the same way. Some patients are very visual learners. Some people are hands-on learners. Some people like to listen and then put their, what they've learned into practice. In my experience, I tend not to give them the written instructions initially. I make them look and listen and then provide the written instructions afterwards that they can refer to. This works for most people, but for some, they need something in writing in their hands as they're learning. Assessment of patient proficiency is important. Patients need to return, demonstrate what they've been taught and to be able to do what you've taught them effectively. Again, patients need to be engaged and evolved, and the ongoing support is also critical. <clears throat> so the decisions that need to be made with the patient, with the teacher, and the prescriber are the number of sites that are going to be used and the volume per site. For children, this usually is not a consideration, but if you have an adult who needs 10 grams of subcutaneous gamma globulin per week, you can be talking about 50 cc's that need to be infused subcutaneously. Clearly, all of that can't go into a single site. The desired infusion time is also important. Patients need to determine how long they want their infusions to take, and this may, if they'd like a faster infusion versus a slower infusion, this may mean it's necessary to split the infusions into twice per week or increase the number of infusion sites. The needle length is also a critical factor in the success or lack thereof of this therapy and something that the nurse needs to consider. But again, all of these decisions need to be made in collaboration with the patient. If you prescribe a regimen that's difficult for the patient to follow, he's not going to follow it. So what's the point? So there's a self-administration skill set, which is probably a no-brainer. The patients need to be familiar with the equipment and how to handle the equipment. They need to understand aseptic technique and infection control. This isn't surgery. It doesn't need to be a sterile procedure, but it certainly needs to be a clean procedure. And when you're setting up your infusion on the kitchen countertop, it probably shouldn't be the same kitchen countertop that you've just cut up chicken on. It needs to be an aseptic technique. Pump setup, priming the infusion set, choosing the site, putting the needle in, all of those are things the patients need to demonstrate and be skillful at. The nurse, again, needs to explain the benefits of the therapy, expected side effects, and management. And the patients do need to keep some kind of diary documenting that they've given their dose, how they've given their dose, where they've given their dose, and have there been any problems with the dosage or that particular infusion. This slide just shows an example of some of the subcutaneous equipment we use. By no means is it exhaustive, but it does give you an idea. There's various pumps on the market that will provide the therapy, whether they're roller cassette type pumps or whether they're syringe driver pumps. There are similarly multiple needle sets. 
There are sets that have a single infusion site. There are also sets that have six separate needles on, on them so that you can give the therapy into six sites simultaneously. There are also some needle insertion devices that I personally find very effective for children. Even my children, I engage early on and make it important for them to understand that this therapy is part of their lives. And I encourage them to take an active role in delivering the therapy as soon as possible, whether that's as simple as turning the pump off and on or as in pushing the button on the needle insertion device. Choosing a good site for the infusion is important. Generally, what I tell my patients is that anywhere they can pinch an inch is probably okay to administer. For most of my patients, that's in their abdomen. Most women have a lovely little muffin top that the needles fit securely into and are securely into the subcutaneous tissue. Men tend to have a more medial distribution of fat and love handles work very well for them. I have several patients that use the outer, upper aspect of their buttocks, and I have a couple of patients who use the backs of their upper arms. Patients will find what site works best for them. As with this therapy, not to beat a dead horse, one site doesn't fit all, the same way that one way of giving yourself an infusion doesn't fit all. The important thing to know is that when you're using multiple sites, they need to be a minimum of two inches apart and usually I tell patients even a little bit more than two inches is good. Generally I tell patients to go the distance between their thumb and their index finger and keep that, that spacing for their needles. So when you think about it, you're putting drug someplace where there's really not any place to go. It's not like a tunnel, like a vein is, where you're putting drug in and it's swishing around the circulatory system. If you think about it, subcutaneous fat cells are lined up like a brick wall, and you have to move these cells apart for the drug to go in. So initially, with your initial infusions, there's gonna be outward swelling. The drug is going to make a lovely little lump. Subsequently, the, the subcutaneous cells get used to the drug. If you use the same general area, they become mushy for lack of a very official medical term and move aside more readily. So with subsequent infusions, instead of the outward swelling, you get a more lateral distribution of the drug. For that reason, many patients like to use the same general area. Now I'm very careful to say, don't look for the same hole that you used last week, but many people tend to use the same area consistently. Now it's possible that you can get small, what are called pearls, that become hard and do reabsorb over time, but you want to avoid those little hard pearls when you are inserting the needle. But site rotation really is a, is a decision that patients can make for themselves. Most of my patients, as I said, tend to use the same general area for their infusions and don't switch from the arm to the leg to the belly week after week after week. It's important to remember that you want the drug to be infused subcutaneously. All of the products on the market at this point in time are irritating to the dermis. You want all of the drug to be securely in the subcut tissue, not in the muscle and not in the dermal layer. So for some patients, using a plump up technique, or pulling up technique works very well and the needle gets securely into the subcutaneous tissue. Alternatively, for some patients, giving a little bit of tension on the skin, not plumping, but pulling the skin apart and inserting the needle works better. Whatever method is used, it's important to remember that the needle needs to be securely in the subcutaneous tissue so that no drug leaks into the dermis or is given intramuscularly. The analogy I give for my patients is a piece of cake with icing on it. If you think of the icing as the dermis and the cake as the subcutaneous tissue, you want the needle to be safely in the cake and not in the frosting. And patients usually understand that analogy pretty well. Choosing the needle is critical. The needle length absolutely affects site reaction. Too short of a needle, as I said, can mean that the drug is infused into the intradermal layer.
which will cause much more irritation and will be acutely uncomfortable for patients. There all can be, also can be leakage at the site if the needle is too short. The range of needle lengths that are currently available go all the way from 4 millimeters long to 14 millimeters long on the subcutaneous sets designed for this therapy. If a longer needle is used, I'm sorry, if a longer needle is needed, butterflies can be used, which are a little bit longer than 14 millimeters. And just a simple 23 or 25 gauge butterfly can be used effectively for this therapy. The gauge of the needle will affect the rate of infusion. Clearly, it's a no-brainer. If you use a 27 gauge needle, the infusion is going to take longer than if you use a 23 or 24 gauge needle. So choosing the gauge of the needle used is going to be important when the patient tells you, I really would like this infusion to go a little bit more quickly or a little bit more slowly. This is another thing that absolutely has to be individualized based on the patient's needs and wants, as well as the amount of subcutaneous tissue. This is a therapy that sometimes doesn't work as well on a very, very thin patient or a patient with not a lot of body fat. You know, I have a 27-year-old woman who's a marathon runner. I don't even think I can measure her body fat. She uses multiple sites despite the fact that she's not a patient who's overweight in any way, shape, or form, but she uses multiple sites because she doesn't have a great deal of subcutaneous tissue. And if I try to put her entire dose into one or two sites, it becomes acutely uncomfortable for her. So the administration of subcutaneous therapy is pretty much a very basic, simple procedure. Like all procedures, it needs to start with a clean area, and the patients absolutely have to wash their hands and have to prepare their drug on a clean surface. The second step, as is shown on this slide, is that the product needs to be examined. The expiration date needs to be checked, and the product needs to be checked. Sometimes gamma globulin can be a little bit cloudy. Sometimes it can even have a little bit of a yellowish cast. But if there are particles floating in the vial, then it should not be used. If the vial has been frozen, the product has to be discarded. Some subcutaneous products are refrigerated, others are stored at room temperature. We've found that the most effective therapy is given when the product is at room temperature or even body temperature. If you think about it, room temperature is approximately 75 degrees. Most body temperature is 95 or 96 degrees. Sometimes that 20 degree difference is critical to the, excessive, to the success of the infusion. And patients can warm up the drug just by putting it next to the body for 10 or 15 minutes. That will warm the drug up to body temperature, and then they can administer it. This is a decision patients make for themselves and a suggestion that you can make for giving themselves therapy. So after the expiration date has been checked and the solution's been checked, then the drug can be drawn up. I find that most of my patients have more trouble with drawing up the drug than doing needle insertion and giving themselves therapy. It's just a manipulation and a dexterity issue that takes a little bit of practice but can be quickly mastered. Patients need to understand that the product is under a vacuum in the bottle and that the vacuum needs to be reversed to get the product out of the bottle. If a needle is being used to draw up the drug, then air needs to be infused into the vial, and then the syringe plunger pulled back. A Medi spike can also be used, which has a filter on it, which will let air in as product is withdrawn. Either of the methods is appropriate. You need to see what, it, what is being supplied for your patient and teach them with the equipment that's been supplied. We've already discussed choosing the site, which is what number six shows here. Before we get to step seven, which is the insertion of the needle, we need to talk for a second about priming the tubing. As I've said twice now, the drug is irrita irritating to the dermis, so what we want to use for subcutaneous therapy is a dry insertion technique. We don't want to prime all the way through the tubing, through the needle, so that you see a drop of drug at the end of the needle. It's important to leave a small amount of air at the end of the tubing so that no drug is in the needle, therefore not risking getting drug into the dermis as you're inserting the needle. 
So you need to teach your patients when they're priming to prime almost but not quite to the end. Inserting the needle is probably, after drawing up the drug, the thing that patients have the most problem with. Nobody likes to stick themselves. That's a no-brainer. But you can make inserting the needle a very easy process. For most people, getting it down to whether it's counting one, two, three and sticking, or taking a deep breath and sticking, whatever works, works. But patients do need to know how to put the needle in. Generally, a 90 degree insertion technique is used and the needle goes straight in and is taped down. Once the needle is in, it's important to check that it's not in a vessel. This drug needs to be given subcutaneously, not intravenously, so the syringe needs to be taken and the plunger pulled back to make sure there's no blood return. The good news is that there are no major vessels in subcutaneous tissue. They're just small capillaries, small venules, small arterioles, and it's incredibly rare that a vessel has been entered. Saying that, it's possible to nick one of those tiny vessels going by, and there can be some bleeding. But just because there's bleeding doesn't necessarily mean that the needle has been inserted into a vessel. So the needle's now been inserted and is securely taped down, and it's time to start the infusion. Syringe has been loaded into a pump as shown here in step 10. The pump is turned on and the infusion is given. The timing of the infusion will depend on the rate of the pump, the size of the tubing, the size of the needle, the viscosity of the fluid, the temperature of the fluid, and just how much the patient's fat cells are fighting back, just how ready they are to move aside. Taking the needle out or ending the infusion is a straightforward procedure. I like to tell my patients to flush the tubing with a little bit of air until they feel a pop in their skin. This not only flushes the tubing of drug, but puts a small bubble at the end of the needle, sort of an airlock, to keep drug from leaking out of the site. Most of my patients find that to be pretty effective. And the last step is recording the lot numbers of the drug that you've used, the site you've used, the time the infusion has taken, and whether or not there's been an immediate reaction. After the therapy is done, you need to address these sorts of issues. There are potential injection site reactions. These, the good news is that these reactions tend to be worse with the first infusions and decrease dramatically over time. Intuitively, that makes perfect sense. When you give this infusion for the first time, your body says, whoa, what is this stuff? And sets off its entire inflammatory cascade. There's swelling, there's inflammation. But with subsequent infusions, the body recognizes the drug, recognizes it as not something foreign, and the whole cascade isn't initiated. So the good news is, that with subsequent infusions, localized site reactions get better to where patients who've done this therapy for a while have no reactions or very, very slight reactions. The important adjustments that the nurse needs to consider with the patient are, again, what we've already talked about, the length of the needle, the location of sites, the rate of infusion, and the volume being put into each site. The Fusion rates and the site volumes are in the prescribing data, but this is something that can be modified with patient wishes and patient desired in collaboration with the patient, the prescriber, and you, the nurse teacher. It's important to handle patients' concerns and to give them answers to their questions, to help them work through difficulties and work through problems. The success of subcutaneous therapy really depends on the patient's perception of how it's working for them, how it's fitting into their lifestyle, and what kinds of problems they're having with it. As I said previously, the good news is that localized reactions definitely decrease over time, as is shown in this slide. The more you do it, 
the more the body recognizes the drug and the less rejection type symptoms the body needs to display. Expected in injection site reactions are going to be redness, are going to be swelling, there's going to be some discomfort. I've probably taught close to 200 patients now to give subcutaneous therapy. No one has ever said to me that the therapy is painful. People have said there's a very peculiar sensation. I had a little boy tell me the feeling was fuzzy, which I really couldn't figure out, but then when I thought about it, it made sense that the solution was pushing into the fat cells and making a, a kind of a bubbly kind of feeling. So it made sense when I thought about it, but no one has ever said to me, this is acutely painful. There can be some rash afterwards, there can be some blanching of the site, there can also be some itching at the site, either during infusion or afterwards. This again, it would be an intuitive thing when you're thinking about the skin stretching, that of course it's going to be a little bit itchy. This slide shows an example of some mild injection site reactions. So 15 minutes before the end of the infusion when the, almost all of the drug is in, clearly, it, as this slide shows, there's a bubble, there's a collection of drug. The bubble gets a little bit bigger at the end of the infusion, but then goes down dramatically over time until the bubble and the swelling goes away. For most of my patients, the swelling lasts a matter of hours, and they go to bed at night, and when they get up in the morning, there's no swelling at all. This is an example of a little bit more severe, and I use the word severe, ca not casually, um, reaction. This has some blanching, some swelling, um, and this would be a more, would be a mild site reaction, but a little bit more than is shown in the previous slide. These are just more examples of reactions. You can see some redness, and this is a child who's used three separate sites, and you can see the three separate red swollen sites on her tummy. So as we've said, systemic reactions to subcutaneous gamma globulin are really very rare. Even patients who required pre-medication for IV gamma globulin generally do not need it for subcutaneous gamma globulin. Basically, you're giving a small dose into some place where it's going to be absorbed very slowly so you don't get a huge peak of gamma globulin. So pretreatment routinely is not recommended at all. Saying that, we've demonstrated that you can get local reactions that vary in severity. The good news is that local reactions tend to decrease over time as the body and the subcutaneous skin cells get used to recognizing the gamma globulin. Treatment of those local reactions is absolutely intuitive. If you've got something that's red, hot, and swollen, obviously you're going to put a little bit of heat on it. If it's a little bit sore, you're going to take some acetaminophen and some ibuprofen, and that should take care of the problem. Similarly, there are some patients who complain that after their subcutaneous infusion, their skin is itchy. It's postulated that that itchiness is probably the result of just the skin cell stretching. Systemic diphenhydramine or another antihistamine usually does not take care of that itching. The best thing to do is to treat it topically with some hydrocortisone or even the application of some cold. And that generally takes care of things beautifully. So in summary, the nursing responsibilities are pretty much exactly what you would think they would be. It's critical that we make sure our patients are educated about their disease, understand their therapy, understand the meaning for their therapy. And this is something that you can't teach once. It needs to be reinforced, and patients truly do need to understand it and articulate their understanding. Teaching the skills is also a no-brainer. You can't prescribe therapy and not tell people how to do it and help them find a way that works for them. On an ongoing basis, it's critical and I can't underscore that too much, to make sure that you can find a regimen that will work for patients with which they can be compliant. Making a complicated regimen that a patient's not going to do is counterproductive. 
if you think the patient needs five infusion sites and sticking one needle in themselves makes them queasy, the thought of sticking five needles is probably not something that they're going to do and they're not going to be compliant with the therapy that you think they should be getting. Troubleshooting is also critical. Patients can't just be thrown off the pier into the deep water. There needs to be follow-up. Questions need to be asked. How did the therapy go? What kinds of problems did you have? Were there issues that you'd like to make a little better that we can help with? That ongoing troubleshooting and communication is critical, and I think that the previous speakers have addressed that as well as I. So in conclusion, subcutaneous immunoglobulin is a safe, effective therapy. It provides good replacement of antibodies and good prophylaxis for infections. Most patients are very, very satisfied with this therapy. They feel like they've gotten control of their lives and are managing their disease. The key piece for care providers is that education and continued monitoring are critically important. These are patients that can't be thrown off the pier into the deep water. They have to be followed. There has to be ongoing communication. How is your therapy going? Do you have problems with infusions? Would you like to make your infusions slower, faster? Would you like this ther therapy to be over and done with as quickly as possible? There are multiple permutations possible, and I guarantee there's a permutation that can be found for every patient with which they can be compliant and will satisfy them with regard to the replacement therapy. Thank you.